Kwei. Greetings to all our alumni and friends from all over the world. I'm Karen Thompson from the Alumni Relations team at the University of Auckland. Welcome to the final talk for Raising the Bar Home Edition. We've had an exciting few weeks learning about a wide range of research from psychedelic drugs to anti-vaxxers and COVID-19. You'll find recordings of all the webinars on our Alumni and Friends website. We end the series tonight with a fascinating topic, gene editing and the complex issues that surround it. Our speaker is Dr. Hilary Shepard, a senior lecturer in stem cell and development, developmental, sorry, developmental biology in the Faculty of Science. Joining Hilary is our MC tonight, James Hucklesby, who is now working on his PhD in biological sciences. James will introduce Hilary in more detail in a minute, and later he'll talk to her about her research before asking the questions you, the audience, have. On behalf of the alumni relations team at the University of Auckland, I'd like to say a big thanks to our speakers and our MCs for taking the time to be part of Raising the Bar Home Edition, and to you, our alumni and friends, for joining in. I hope you enjoy tonight's talk. Over to you now, James. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Karen, for that interruption. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us uh, from all over the world for this kind of slightly homish uh, edition of Raising the Bar. Um, me and Hillary are actually both on campus, about two doors down from each other, so we're nice and noise isolated. Um, and it's really lovely, uh, to be honest, to be back on site. Um, but yeah, so it's my incredible pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker to the, for tonight, uh, Dr. Hilary Shepard. So who is Hilary? Well, Hilary is a senior lecturer in stem cell and developmental biology uh, here at the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Auckland. So Hilary's background is all around is all based around cell differentiation, which is how your cells know how to become all the different parts of your body, even though they share the same genetic code. More recently though, uh, Hillary's research has moved into more applied biology, and she's been doing a lot of work on how we can use genetic technologies to enhance the immune system to fight cancer. Most recently, she's been working on brand new treatments for epidermolosis bullosa, which is a condition that causes people to have excessively fragile skin. So it's great that uh, she's got that clinical spin. And I think that in sharing that with us, it will really highlight the ethics and the really in-depth topics that we're going to talk about tonight. So before I pass over to Hillary, um, just a quick overview of the plan. So Hillary is going to spend about half an hour uh, telling us about her work, giving us a bit of an introduction on gene technology, and presenting some future scenarios of what genetic technology could do and allowing us to decide whether or not we think those might be ethical. Uh, because this is such an ethical based topic, um, we've also got a few polls along the way. Uh, so feel free to join in, keep an eye out for those. Uh, and we'll be discussing the results of those afterwards uh, in our little fireside chat. So after Hillary's talk, which will take about half an hour, we're going to have a brief chat, uh, talk about some of the key points, and then we'll start working through um, the questions. So if you have a burning question, of which I'm sure there will be many, uh, there is a Q&A function, which will be right at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's the two little uh, question bubbles, and that'll remain open from now throughout the course of the webinar. So feel free to put your questions in there. You also have the opportunity to upvote questions. So if you see a question that you really want answered, uh, hit the little upvote button, and then it'll jump up to the top of the screen. And then I'll be able to put those to Hillary, and we'll be able to see what she does. So um, without further delay, um, I'll pass you over to Hillary, uh, who hopefully will give us a really interesting introduction to gene technology. So I'll let her uh, take it away and chat with you soon. Thanks, James. And Kia ora, welcome everyone. Great to um, have you here. Uh, I'm just going to get my presentation up. Here we go. Can you see that? I hope you can see my screen. Um, so to, tonight I'd like to talk about gene editing in humans and ask the question, are we ready? And we, we uh, want to ask, are we ready from a technical point of view? Are we ready from an ethical point of view? And are we ready as a society? And so and for which um, we're going to explore these viewpoints as they relate to different scenarios. So I'm a trained molecular and cellular biologist 
and I use gene editing as a research tool in my lab. So I have my own views on this, but I'm not interested in my views, I'm interested in your views. I'm interested in broadening this discussion on how we use gene editing, because it's a powerful tool, it's a versatile tool, and it's gonna have implications for all of mankind, really. So I, my aim tonight is to help to broaden the discussion so that we all know what uh, gene editing can do now and what it can do in the future. So we don't need just scientists involved in this, discussing this topic, we need bioethicists, clinicians, people who might carry genetic conditions, people with different religious beliefs, people from ethnically diverse backgrounds, and people from all over the world who might have different access to um, medicines. Um, so I recognize that it's a sensitive topic. We're talking about gene editing, you know, essentially tinkering with DNA. This is gonna be a scary concept for some people. If we're talking about doing gene editing in embryos, we're talking about artificial fertilization. Again, a controversial topic. And the whole topic is to do with human health, which can be sensitive. But I think because it's such a sensitive topic, it's more important that we really just deal with it head on, have those gnarly discussions, and come to a consensus as a nation and, and internationally is so important. So most of you, of you will have already heard something about gene editing. It's a te technology with wide ranging applications to agriculture, conservation and healthcare. And in this talk, I'm just going to limit myself to healthcare because that's my research background. But first of all, what is gene editing? Well, it's a technique that allows us to make specific and precise changes to DNA, the DNA within a cell. So this is the DNA that makes up our genome. And in the last five years, we've actually been able to edit DNA for, for quite a long time, but it's this new gene editing tool called CRISPR-Cas9 that's come online in the last decade or so, that's really revolutionizing the field because it's relatively cheap and easy to work with and it's, and it's effective. So how does it work? Well, the tool is called CRISPR-Cas9, and we can think of the Cas9 component as a pair of molecular scissors. So um, these scissors can be guided to a specific place within the genome. That's the CRISPR part of the molecule. And when it's guided to this single specific location in the genome, it creates a double-stranded DNA break. Now cells hate double-stranded DNA breaks, and they're gonna to work to very quickly use their own repair machinery to fix that break. Now the repair that they create is typically imperfect and that will cause the gene to be knocked out. It will create a stop signal within the gene. So um, this technology is very effective at turning genes off. But what we can also do is when we um, put the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery into the cell, we can also add in um, a template for repair shown here in this, as this orange molecule. Now this template for repair can guide the cell as it repairs itself to insert um, specific edits that we've told it to incorporate based on this um, orange molecule here. So we can make very precise and specific edits into the DNA. So you can think of it a little bit like a copy and paste function in Word, although it's slightly less precise. And this is one of the issues we'll be discussing. So why do we want to create DNA edits? Well, it's a fantastic research tool. We can knock out genes, we can create variants of genes that are, allow us to understand gene function in a way that wasn't previously possible. What about moving this technique out of the lab and into the clinic? So there's about 5,000 genes that affect over 250 million people globally that are caused by changes in just one gene. We refer to these as monogenetic conditions. That's where it's one broken gene is causing um, a disease. So this would include conditions like cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, and sickle cell anemia. So these conditions lend themselves to gene editing because it's one single gene that we have to fix. So as I said, in my lab, we use the CRISPR-Cas9 um, tool. We use it to knock out genes to help us to determine the function of those genes. It's a fantastic research tool. But we're also developing methods that we hope will one day allow us to fix genes, broken genes in people. 
So one of the focuses of my research is on a debilitating fragile skin disorder, James has always re already referred to it, is called epidermolosis bullosa. It's a very rare condition. It affects about 200 individuals in New Zealand and about half a million uh, globally. It's rare, but it can be devastating for severely affected individuals. It, essentially what it does is it, it affects the glue that holds your skin cells together. It's a single gene that's broken and it affects the glue that, that keeps your skin intact. And so without that glue, everyday living becomes a real challenge because normal wear and tear causes your skin to blister and um, peel off in some cases. It's very painful and importantly, there is no cure. It's just palliative care. So for some severely affected individuals, they can spend hours every day having their wounds um, bandaged and even uh, the cost of bandages for an individual can exceed 100,000 New Zealand dollars a year. So it's a single broken gene in each affected individual. So it's a great candidate for gene editing. So what we propose to do is take a punch biopsy of skin from an affected individual. And we're talking about a very small piece of skin, about as the size of my little fingernail here. Now we can take these punch biopsies and we can extract the cells that uh, line the skin. So this is a cartoon of skin and cross section. This is the outside of your skin. The outer layer of your skin is called the epidermis, and the cells that live here are called keratinocytes. And the cells that live in the lower levels of your skin, that's called the dermis, these cells are called the fibroblast cells here. So the, these pictures are of cells that we've isolated from patients who um, carry this EB condition. So our plan is that we can fix the broken gene in these cells when we have them in the lab. And um, once we've created a um, fixed cell, we can then create 3D gene edited patient specific skin sheets that could be used as a permanent solution to cover some of these problematic wounds that people with EB have. So currently we're at the research stage, but we do have our eye firmly set on translating what we do in the lab to allow us to go into the clinic to help these people. Now, it might sound crazy and it might sound futuristic, but there is precedent for this in the field. Notably, a few years ago, um, a child who had this condition, um, he got a bacterial infection and he lost 80% of the total um, surface, total body surface area of his skin, he lost 80% of his skin. And he was in a bad way. So as a compassionate use case, um, a lab in Europe, was able to grow a transgenic skin for this um, child. So this wasn't really gene editing. Rather than fix the broken gene, they overexpressed the broken gene using a viral vector. So that's called a transgenic approach. Um, and uh, with a few um, skin grafts and eight months in hospital, this child was able to leave school and he's returned back to primary school and he's playing football. So the precedent is there for this type of approach. The approach we're using is that rather than overexpress the gene using a viral vector, we're going to try and fix that broken gene in a very precise way using gene editing. And we think that the techniques that we are developing will facilitate an easier translation into the clinic. So it's been an amazing field to work in, and it's certainly had some highlights and some lowlights. So a highlight would have been uh, last year in 2020 when the two female scientists who discovered the power of CRISPR and its um, use in mammalian um, cells, uh, Jennifer Doudner and Emmanuel Charpentier, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2020. So that was fantastic, a great highlight um, for CRISPR-Cas9. A low light of the field was obviously uh, in November 2018 when reports came out that a scientist in China had edited twin baby girls. Uh, allegedly, his plan was to make them resistant to HIV infection. Now, when I heard this news, I mean, I literally, it was one of those fall off your chair moments. I was just so worried that he'd used this tool, which is an amazing tool in the lab. It's not, in my opinion, yet ready to be used. Uh, on human embryos. So I was very worried about how it was going to affect the field. If there's one good thing that came out of the so-called CRISPR baby fiasco, 
is that very quickly there was a worldwide reaction to condemn what this rogue scientist had done. And so, and it's really opened up this um, topic for us to explore the ethical issues. So what he did, this rogue scientist, was riddled with all sorts of technical and ethical issues. But rather than dwell on what he did, I think we could explore the ethical issues by looking at some different healthcare scenarios where we could possibly use gene editing. So the scenarios that we're going to discuss tonight were actually proposed first by the Royal Society of New Zealand um, in this uh, paper that they published in 2019. So they're looking at um, gene editing scenarios in healthcare. And the reason why I'm using their examples is I think they're uh, great examples that allow us to explore many of the technical and ethical issues in this area. And also, if you're interested to learn more, I'd encourage you to Google um, the Royal Society gene editing documents because they've done a fantastic job. So a fantastic resource if you want to learn more. So let's have a look at these scenarios. <clears throat> now what I want to do, I'm going to, uh, first of all, um, tell you about the four scenarios, and then we're going to have a poll, and we're going to see whether you think these are suitable scenarios for gene editing or not. Then we're going to talk through some of the issues around them. And at the end of my talk, we'll revisit the scenarios and we'll see if anyone's changed their mind. And I'm truly interested to hear what your opinions are on whether these, when we should use gene, gene editing and when we shouldn't. So first of all, let's consider scenario one. So here we have an individual with sickle cell anemia. Now, um, this particular individual, um, has uh, a single broken gene that affects their red blood cells. It affects their ability to carry oxygen. So these individuals uh, are often anemic and they need um, blood transfusions, but also they get what are called sickle cell crises. Their blood vessels get blocked and they have very painful crises. And both of these um, conditions necessitate frequent trips to the hospital. So what we are proposing here is to take bone marrow from this individual, so it's the bone marrow stem cells are the precursors to the affected red blood cells. We can edit them in the lab, fix that broken gene, and then reinfuse these cells back into this individual. And I should point out that currently there is no cure for this condition. Okay, so how do you feel about that? Do you think that's a reasonable use of um, gene editing? Maybe we could start our poll now so people can um, Think about that. Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it's not a good idea? Or are you not sure? Okay. I think what we do is we'll let the poll run and then we'll go on to scenario two. So I'll give you another few seconds. I have to say, overwhelmingly, this is looking like people are in favor. Okay. Okay, let's go on to scenario number two. So I'm just gonna, I might write that down. Five, three and three. Okay, so let's think about scenario two. So here we have an individual who um, comes from a family history of early onset breast cancer. It's a middle-aged lady. She knows um, that she carries uh, a broken copy of this BRCA1 gene and it predispos predisposes her to um, getting early onset breast cancer, and there's a whole family history where they are all carrying this gene. She hasn't got cancer herself yet, um, but she really doesn't want to pass this burden onto her um, offspring. So she's proposing that she would like to have a child by IVF and to have that BRCA gene, that potentially cancer causing gene, uh, removed. So, can we have a poll on that one? How do you all feel about that as a gene editing scenario? I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Okay. We've got a few more I'm not sure's on this one. As I would predict. Five more seconds. Okay, four, four six. And 14. Okay, so that's scenario number two. Let's just get rid of that one. Okay, scenario number three. Here we've got a male, he's a, he's a middle-aged male. 
Um, he has a family history of people dying in their 40s and 50s from cardiovascular disease. So his family have a tendency to carry two high levels of fat in the blood. Now, there's no genetic cause that's been found in his family, but he has found that current medications just don't seem to be helping him. Um, so he's been doing a bit of Googling and he's found that there's a particular gene called PCSK9 that if it's mutated or knocked out, naturally occurring mutations drastically reduce the levels of um, fat that are in the blood. And so what he would like to do is edit his own liver cells, mutate his normal copy of the PCSK9 gene and hopefully reduce his risk of cardiovascular disease. So if we could have the poll on that one, let's see how everyone thinks about that. Okay, cardiovascular, sickle cell. Okay, we're definitely getting less sure, more I'm not sure's, quite a few no's on that one and quite a few yeses. Okay, let's go on to the last scenario. Okay, so the last scenario, I don't know if you can see it there. Okay, so in this scenario, we've got a healthy couple, they're a sporty couple, um, they approach um, a fertility services clinic, nothing wrong with these people at all, but they want to have a child who has um, hopefully increased athletic performance, and they want to achieve that by um, editing the embryo to have enhanced levels of a protein called erythropoietin. This is gonna help the oxygen carrying capability of the child. Um, they hope that this means that their child will perform better at a range of sports and have a more accomplished and fulfilled life. So how do we feel about gene editing in that scenario? Can we have the poll up on that one? EPO. I'm going to refer to it as EPO in future. Okay, decidedly different profile here, but there's no such thing as a wrong answer. I'm genuinely, what you know, interested in what people think. Okay, so we're getting more no's on that one. Okay, I think we'll end that poll at that point. So. You can see that really we're, we're going through a whole range of ethical issues and options when we look at these four scenarios. So let's unpack it a little bit. Okay, so first of all, I think when we're talking about gene editing, most people would like to think that we are fulfilling an unmet need when we do this gene editing. So in our sickle cell anemia situation, I said there actually is no cure. You can do um, bone marrow transplants, but they're quite tricky. So really sickle cell anemia is an unmet health need. So this is a good thing. I give that a tick. We are dealing with gene editing um, of adult cells from a fully informed and consented adult. So I'm going to give that a tick. Consent is so important. Full informed consent is very important. The changes that are being made to this individual's bone marrow cells will not, not be inherited by subsequent generations. So that gets a tick for me because I think it's important the changes are not well, it's an issue whether these changes that are being made are inherited down future generations or not. So that gets a tick for no inheritance. And essentially, I think here the risk of the treatment um, is smaller than the benefit. So um, the risk to benefit ratio is good. The risk is small and the benefit is high to the individual. So actually, it gets lots of ticks. And in fact, clinical trials are already taking place where gene editing has been used to treat people with sickle cell anemia. So um, it is still at the clinical trial phase, but we do have data with um, patients who um, have been followed up to 24 months post-treatment, a single dose of gene edited cells these patients have gone from needing to go to the hospital maybe 10 times a year for their sickle cell crises and blood transfusions to needing to go to the hospital zero. So it's having a dramatic impact on those patients' lives. A remarkable treatment. So fantastic. I think 
Then my next box down here is, is it equitable? I'm not sure. The price tag for a similar treatment in America is about US $2 million for a single treatment. The good news is you only pay if it's effective and you can get a five-year payment plan. But I mean, really, these are not cheap, cheap treatments. So whether it's equitable or not remains to be seen. Who's going to be paying for these treatments? And I think one issue is, is um, you know, in countries like Africa and India, where this condition is much more prevalent, where they don't have advanced health systems, are people there going to have access to these amazing treatments? So equity is an issue with gene editing. Okay, let's look at scenario two. So this was the BRCA1 gene where somebody wanted to edit their embryo to take out the risk of breast and ovarian cancer, basically. So I'm seeing a lot of crosses here now. Does it fulfill an unmet need? I would argue it doesn't. You know, if you're gonna do gene editing in an embryo, you have to do uh, in vitro fertilization. Now with in vitro fertilization, typically you're gonna have a number of embryos and some of those will, the way genes work, some of those will not carry the BRCA1 uh, mutation. So we can do what's called pre-implantation genetic testing and select the embryos that do not carry the gene. To my mind, and certainly uh, with the efficiency of gene editing now, that is a much safer approach. It's a proven technology. So I don't think it's fulfilling an unmet need. Is it consented? No, we're dealing with an embryo. So there's no way an embryo can consent and there's no way we, it can be fully informed. So that gets a big cross. Will the changes that are made be inherited? Yes, they will. This is germline editing. But if we're editing an embryo, that means they will um, transmit that edited gene down their future generations. So it's inheritable. And does the risk, um, is the risk smaller than the benefit? Um, well, I would say in this case, uh, no. The thing about gene editing, and I kind of alluded to it um, earlier, is, you know, I said it's like this copy-paste function, but not as precise. There is the risk that, um, you know, you might be aiming to edit the BRCA1 gene, but there may be unintended so-called off-target consequences. These are, the, these are the issues where you accidentally might hit gene Y, you didn't intend to, or there may be other changes of the DNA that you weren't expecting. Until uh, gene editing becomes more precise, which it will be, it will get more precise and we're already heading that way. But right now, as things exist, it is not, not entirely precise enough to use in an embryo. In some scenarios, absolutely it's safe enough, but not for embryos, that's my opinion. Is it equitable? That probably won't be, right? It's gonna be expensive. Okay, let's consider scenario C. This is where we wanted to try and improve cardiovascular health by creating a new mutation in the PCSK9 gene. This is, um, is it fulfilling an unmet need? Well, you could argue it is. I, I told you that this person wasn't responding to medications. So this person wants to prevent disease. So in some cases, you could say it's similar to a vaccine, right? He, he wants to prevent future disease. The person is making edits to themselves, so it's consented, he's fully informed, he would be fully consented. And the changes are being made to liver cells. So the changes that are being made at the DNA level will not be inherited. So he gets three tips. But does the benefit outweigh the risk? And I think the answer there would have to be no. Because what we're talking about here is editing inside the body, creating new variants. We don't even know what variants we're gonna make. Um, variants that may not have been seen in nature before. We don't really know what the impact of that would be when you're doing it in a whole human system. Yes, there are animal models that predict that it could work, but it's just too risky, I would say, at this stage to, to create new variants in vivo. Yeah. We can't screen when you're when you're doing edits inside a human in the liver, you can't screen to see really what's going on. OK, and then our final example is where we're going to create an embryo with enhanced levels of EPO to increase its um, athletic performance. So I think it's pretty clear here. It is not about fulfilling an unmet need. We're really getting into the area of enhancing um, enhancing an individual over and above the norm. We're really getting it to the end of designer babies here. 
Is the change that is being made consented? No, because again, we're dealing with an embryo. Will the changes that are being made be inherited? Yes, um, the changes that are being made will be inherited down that line. And does the benefit to the individual outweigh the, the risk? Well, as I said in our other embryo um, example, I would argue no, we don't know what unintended effects there may be from the technical point of gene editing, but also do we even know enough about um, EPO and, and how we can change the levels of EPO? We do know that like some uh, elite athletes can inject themselves with a protein form of EPO to try and increase their um, performance. If you overdose, it can cause blood thickening, clotting, heart attack. So do you really want to create a baby where, you know, if you get the dose wrong, those could be possible um, outcomes. And is it equitable? I mean, again, you really, I think when you're getting to this end of the gene editing spectrum, which is designer babies, it's really getting into the haves versus the have-nots, or it could be. So I suspect it won't be equitable. So I guess to play devil's advocate, so you know, I, I'm not, I don't think enhancing above what's normal is really ideal, but you could argue that we're missing an opportunity if we don't go down the enhancement route. We could build humans who've got stronger bones humans who are more resistant to climate change. You know, some people would argue we're missing an opportunity here. You know, if we could remove the risk of conditions like cystic fibrosis, um, even conditions like dwarfism or deafness have been targeted or, you know, touted as potential targets for gene editing. Um, why wouldn't we? But I guess that brings me to my next point, which is really what is an undesirable trait and who makes those decisions? You know, is being deaf uh, a bad thing? Is being dwarf, a dwarf a bad thing? Um, I have read that apparently some deaf communities are worried that if um, editing out deafness is becomes feasible, that they'll feel under pressure to do that. And really, what I mean, do we really want a homogenous society where we're all becoming more and more similar genetically? We're really sort of perhaps paving the way for a form of eugenics. This is. This is where we need to decide, you know, where do we draw the line? Um, a counter argument could be that we are too focused on DNA. You know, we, you know, maybe we're, it's not such a big deal. We, um, we think of our DNA, our genomes as static things. But in fact, they're not. So when we're born, when we create a baby, there's a huge reshuffling of genetic material from the mother and the father. A baby is born and from the day we're born our cells start to accumulate genetic random mutations and they accumulate as we um, as our cells divide mutations are going to occur naturally and there's environmental factors that have an influence too so if we're exposed to chemicals if we're exposed to the sun that rate of mutation changes in the dna starts to accumulate so maybe with gene editing when we're really aiming to make very precise changes to the dna that's much safer than just the random mutations that occur naturally. And of course, DNA isn't the end of the story. We may have a gene, but it, there's another layer of regulation on top of the DNA, which is whether that gene is turned on and off, on or off. So DNA is not the end of the story. So I guess really the issue is, is who should decide when and where we use gene editing? You know, if you're creating a baby by IVF anyway, is it immoral not to edit out risks for HIV infection or cystic fibrosis? You know, would it be immoral not to do that? Now, I note that in the UK, um, you can do pre-implantation genetic testing for 400 conditions, which includes intellectual disability and primordial dwarfism. In the USA, you can do even more conditions and you can select the gender of your baby. So selection is already happening. It might not be a gene edited form of selection, but we are already selecting the gene pool that goes forward to future generations. So, you know, where does gene editing fit in all of this and who should decide when and how we use this tool? This is what interests me. Now, um, as I said, after the CRISPR baby fiasco, 
Scientists globally have called for a moratorium on gene inheritable gene editing, so gene editing of embryos. So moratorium means we're just having a temporary suspension while we have these discussions about the ethics, while the technical issues get resolved, because the technique will get safer and safer to use. So really what I would invite you to consider now is what the intended and unintended impacts of human gene editing are going to be in various scenarios. Because gene editing isn't science fiction anymore. It's here, clinical trials are taking place, even here in Auckland. Um, it's here and it's not going to go away. So um, thanks for your attention. So what I'd like to do now, having been through those discussions about the ethics, is redo that poll and see if anyone's changed their mind about how they feel about these various scenarios of using gene editing. So can we have that poll up again with all four scenarios? Okay, so maybe I'll give you 30 seconds or so and um, it, just tell me, uh, either go with the choice you had before or if you've changed your mind, let's see if, if the numbers have changed. Thanks for that, Hilary. Uh, just while we're waiting for the results to come in, uh, yeah. just a quick plug for the uh, Q&A down the bottom. Uh, so we've got some good questions starting to trickle in, um, but do have a look at them and upvote some of them. Uh, there's going to be, I suspect, more questions than we've got time for. So if you go in and upvote the ones that you'd like us to answer, uh, I'll try and bring those uh, to the top of the queue. Okay, we've still got a few votes coming in. It's interesting, I can see the sickle cell anemia has changed already. Okay, I think that's probably it now. So I'm just going to note those numbers down. Ah, interesting. The EPO example did not change. Okay, have you had a chance to get those numbers down, James? I've got all the numbers in here, yep. Okay, so we can end that poll. Thanks, that was very interesting. I'm just gonna get rid of that. I'll stop sharing my screen now. So, so it looks like the sickle cell, people have now become more in favor of it after mm. a bit about the discussion. For the BRCA gene, we've gone from 44 who said yes before down to 21. Mm -hmm. Right, which is great. I'm I obviously have my own views and I'm trying not to <laughs> pin them on that on this discussion. The cardiovascular disease went down slightly. It's gone from 22 who said yes, 25 said no, and 18 didn't know. Stay fairly the same, although actually a slight increase in the nose. And the EPO condition, so that's really into the designer baby, has stayed exactly the same, no change at all. Mm, it's quite an interesting one there that the um, breast cancer has had such a change because obviously yeah. there's a, they, this is a non trivial process. Um, and I noticed there have been a few questions that have come up in the chat kind of around cost. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just start by discussing, maybe take your EB work as an example. Just talk us through what that actually entails um, from a, almost a practical point of view. In terms of gene editing in the lab, how that- In terms of gene editing, what, why is it so expensive? Yeah, I mean, I guess to fully validate cells, to get them ready to put on a patient, you would have to do a lot of um, screening, looking for off-target effects. Um, you have to have everything up to clinical grade treatments, clinical grade tissue suites, transfer of material. I mean, this $2 million, uh, US price tag, I think also takes into account, um, I've heard you know, companies talking about this, uh, the enhanced quality of life. So it's not just the cost of the treatment, it's also the enhanced quality of life for the patient. And I'd be really interested to see a cost benefit sort of analysis where they look at, for the sickle cell condition, 
how much were these, you know, 10 trips to hospital per year costing versus the treatment? Uh, I don't know if anyone's done that um, scenario. Mm. So, yeah, in terms of uh, exactly how much it would cost, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know. It's all those off target uh, assessments that I think make it really expensive. You want to make sure when you're putting cells on or in patients, it's safe. Mm. And obviously, it's got to be. There's always a cost benefit and i think and another question that's come up in the chat here um, is asking would it actually decrease the cost of health care overall like would it be possible to fix these long-term conditions earlier well yeah i mean I, I i like i say i haven't done the whole cost benefit analysis but i guess that is the hope you know if you can treat someone with sickle cell with a single dose um then yeah hopefully potentially you could I mean, if we get to the point where we are removing these genes out of the gene pool altogether, then, you know, is that going to reduce the burden on the healthcare system? Potentially, yes, if mm. we go down that route. So how does that sit with, for instance, obviously the conditions that cause the most um, stress on our healthcare system, are, you know, obesity-related disease, diabetes, um, are those potential targets for gene editing? Yeah, so this is the difference between uh, a monogenetic disease, which is what I've exclusively been talk, talking about, one broken gene very clearly causing a disease, and also what's called a polygenic condition. So conditions like diabetes or obesity, many genes are involved in creating these conditions. Sometimes we know what those genes are, sometimes we don't. Um, so until we have a very clear handle on which genes are involved, I think these polygenic conditions are going to be much harder to treat mm. and so a polygenic really, disease is going to be more risky as well to treat absolutely because every gene you target you run the risk of off-target effects and also i mean we we we're, we're very complex systems and um you know we all have a different background of genetic uh mutations and genes so what if, if we edit a gene in me, it might have a different impact to them if we edit a gene in you. Mm. So genetic risk scores, I mean, it is a, a science that's developing. We're getting much better at predis, predicting so-called polygenic risk for conditions like cardiovascular disease, depression. Um, but it's not yet a precise science that we could say target genes X, Y, Z, and you'll sort the issue. And yeah, a lot of these polygenic risk scores have been done in a certain uh, genotype. And so different populations from different areas of the world are gonna have different polygenic risk scores. And so there's issues there. Like, so minority um, indigenous populations might miss out. And this gets back to the equity issues that are gonna always rear their head, I think, in this topic. Mm. So obviously bearing in mind what you're saying about how just the quality of um, facilities that's needed to do these treatments. Um, we've got a question from Kelly here asking, do you think the price of gene editing is going to be like we've seen with drugs and gene sequencing in that it precipitously drops over the Absolutely. first few years? Yeah, or do you think it's going to be something like CAR-T that kind of never really becomes a cheap off the shelf option? No, I think it will definitely become cheaper and cheaper. I mean, you know, if you just think about how sequencing is, you know, 20 years ago was enormously expensive. And now if we want to, we can all have our genome sequenced. Um, I'm hoping it will go in that in a similar direction. I think CAR T cells will also become cheaper over time. Mm. Which is quite an interesting um question because I noticed there was a question slightly further down here that was asking can this technology be used um, for people with uh, incurable diseases things like glioblastoma and a variety of cancer lines how close is that um, to going into the clinic um so for cancer um I think we're a fair way away I mean it has to be at the moment a monogenetic disease um, so is gene editing being used? Gene editing is being used to target cancer, but more from using the immune system to, to kill the cancer rather than the cancer itself. Mm. 
we're a fair way away. I mean, everything really is still at the clinical trial stage. So, I mean, I think we've really got to um, address what has come up as the top comment here, which is uh, from Shuhan, which is asking uh, the mRNA vaccines that obviously we're all having in our arms uh, at the moment, how does that differ uh, from gene editing? Yeah, so it is mRNA vaccines are not gene editing. Um, so gene editing is where you're making a change to the DNA within a cell. So mRNA is, um, it's just the template that allows proteins to be made. So the mRNA will not hang around for long in your cell. It will create the protein, which also won't hang around for long, just long enough for the immune system to, to recognize it and to build an immune response to it. So it's definitely not a form of gene editing. So I've had, I'm doubly uh, vaccinated and I would encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Yeah. I think you see all the immunologists getting vaccinated, it kind of, it says something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I work in an immunology lab, so yeah. Um, I just think there's a, there's a few really interesting questions kind of starting to surface here, really around the increase of function mutations, the things that are really going to improve humans rather than simply curing diseases. Um, so what impact do you think do you think we will ever end up doing something like that? And if so, what impact do you think that would have on society? Well, I mean, this is the, the big multi you know, dollar million question. Um, I don't know. I mean, personally, for me right now, I don't see a place for gene editing for enhancements. I think it's great to target an unmet health need in adult cells. That's my personal opinion. Um, do I think we should go for enhancement? Uh, yeah, no, I don't. Um, I just, yeah. Sorry, where, where, where am I going with this? Do, do you think that enhancement will make society more unequal? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, because, I mean, who's gonna pay for these treatments? If individuals have to pay, then it's gonna be the sort of, um, just where something wealthy people can do. So, I mean, currently we have this moratorium, so this we're not going down that route at all. And I don't think there really is much appetite currently to go down there at all. But, you know, in the future, as gene editing becomes safer and safer, it does become a potential option. It's a tricky one. I mean, I'm not a trained ethicist, and this is why I think we all need to be thinking about this. Do we know that? I mean, currently, I don't. So we've got another kind of uh, question along those lines, which is, so you're talking about these off-target effects. And um, what exactly does that entail and how dangerous, how dangerous could those effects be? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And it's just going to vary um, from application to application. So, I mean, typically, I would say the risk is probably quite low you know the genome is a huge uh mass of dna molecules we're targeting one specific area off target effects typically could be um in an area of the genome that's really not doing much so if you think of the genome as a car and you have an off target effect it could just be doing something very minimal like just slightly changing the color of the car or tint to the windows very rarely is it going to affect something important in the engine that's going to stop the engine working altogether. So I would say typically it's either going to have no effect, rarely it might be a negative effect, and very rarely will it be a positive effect. But it's going to be on a case-by-case -case scenario. When we're dealing with um, editing cells in the lab, we can do very careful checks to see what those off-target effects are. I don't want to overemphasize the off-target effects too much because we are moving towards safer and safer forms of gene editing. So there's a new kid on the block called prime editing, which I think um, is not yet ready um, to use in the clinic, but it's just showing as a proof of principle that editing will become safer and safer. And we're going to see less of those off-target effects. Do you think it'll ever become safer than an off-the-shelf drug? Potentially, I think it has the potential. I mean, one of the issues is this double-stranded DNA break, cells don't like double-stranded DNA. So these new variants avoid the need for any double-stranded DNA break at all. 
So, um, I, yeah, absolutely. I think it could become very safe, particularly for use in adult cells. So I think you know, using it in somatic, we call them somatic cells, cells of the body that will not cause any changes to be made to be inherited, it, it's definitely going to get safer and safer. And I mean, it really is already being safe. The clinical trials would suggest, which are already two years old, suggest that it is safe. Mm. And it really sounds like this is a happening thing, which kind of brings me on to the next kind of line that I thought would be quite interesting, which is asking kind of more about the regulatory um, side of this. And we've got a really interesting question here from um, Cassie, who's asking if athletes are using uh, EPO through gene editing, is there any way that we could detect that? Now, that's a great question. And this is the thing about gene editing. The changes you make, um, really, you're just using the, the cell's own repair machinery. So it's not like there's going to be any telltale pieces of viral vector DNA that we can detect. Yeah, we, you could gene edit somebody. And really, I don't think there's any, depending on the technique you use to do that gene editing, there's really no way of knowing. So that's a great question. And this is why, yeah, it's a tricky one. You know, as I, we're accumulating mutations, changes to our DNA are occurring all the time. So yeah, very hard to detect. I mean, it really sounds like that this gene editing is gonna become more and more a part of medicine. And um, so who really do you think is gonna end up regulating this? Will it be the WHO? Will it be country by country? Yeah, well, this is this is the issue. Um, so the World Health Organization has recently just published a paper, like literally last month, where they've been thinking about this. They had a committee that's specifically thinking about gene editing. They've been they've convened for two years and they've just published a report, and they're really trying to push to create a, a international framework that can oversee all of gene editing. Because really, we need something that involves all nations to come on board. We don't want to get to a situation where some countries prohibit it. Some countries allow it, therefore some people are going to go off to country X and do their gene editing over there. So the World Health Organization is looking for a global form of governance. They're looking to create a registry where we can um, uh, register all clinical trials that are taking place. And they also want to create a mechanism where if people think someone is doing something unethical, that they have somewhere to go. Because the issue with the CRISPR baby scandal, one of the issues was, Nobody knew, even if they wanted to be the whistleblower, they didn't know what mechanism there was to blow that whistle. The other issue was, is they didn't know if it was legal or illegal in China compared to the country where they were. So these are the issues that make you realize that this needs to have global governance to be effective. So the WHO are doing a great job and they're also advocating for increased um, education um, so that everyone can get on board and have their say. Mm. Cool, so we're um, starting to fast run out of time here. Um, but just thinking on the basis of your kind of comments that this is gonna be a global thing, um, where, where do we sit at the moment? How is New Zealand tracking against the rest of the world? And also, are we working with the rest of the world on things like this? And does your research involve international collaborators? Um, I, I do have international collaborators. Um, uh, so a paper just came out last month um, where we uh, actually, people at Auckland um, have taken part in a clinical trial, an international study that's come out of the UK, um, doing in vivo gene editing, very much like that, um, the liver scenario. So they are targeting, these are people with a, a, a disease, it's a misfolded protein that can accumulate and causes um, neuronal issues. Um, so they've taken part in a clinical trial to do in vivo gene editing. So yeah, New Zealand is right up there with the big boys. Yeah, we're taking part. But um, legally, we are not allowed to do any germline editing in New Zealand. Mm. We are under very high levels of regulation. So everything we do, we have to go through a strict ethical uh, procedure to get ethical permission to do the work we do. And um, we have to go through MedSafe um to get the permissions required so yeah strong regulation which which is good and and as it should be mm. cool well i think that's a really kind of positive spin 
that we are really world leading um, here at the university. And it's very nice that, you know, we're all here um, and together. So do you, very quickly, do you think we're ready? Are we ready? Um, well, I'm ready. That's the ultimate question. Yeah, I did ask the question. Definitely ready for adult cell editing because obviously that's what I am doing. Um, I really think we have an opportunity to help patients with various conditions, be it of blood cells or skin cells. Um, are we ready to edit embryos? I think I made it pretty clear. My uh, opinion is absolutely not. Will we be able to do it in the future? I don't know. Personally, I can't think of many conditions where we couldn't instead do pre-implantation genetic testing. That's my standpoint currently. And, and it's a proven technology. There's very few conditions where you're going to get an embryo or a number of embryos where not one of them doesn't contain a normal copy of that gene that you're interested in. So my feeling would be probably not to go there. Wow, and that's a really... Uh... Interesting conclusion. Did you have something for, else? For, for germline editing. Yeah. editing. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really interesting place to leave on that really we are ready for everything except the germline, obviously, with some uh, caveats. With some caveats. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, not a lot of caveats. It's always a lot of caveats. It's <laughs> um, every you've got to take every situation individually, assess every individual um, scenario. They all have their own issues, but really it comes down to, is it inheritable? And are we dealing with consented, informed adults? And does the risk outweigh the benefit? I mean, the benefit outweigh the risk. Yeah, and does it address an unmet health need? Those are the key things. Cool. Well, uh, on that note, we are entirely out of time. Um, so thank you very much uh, to Hillary for uh, spending the evening uh, here in Auckland. It's coming up nine o'clock for those of you who are overseas um, and really giving us an insight uh, into what I think is a massively fast changing and also really complex thing that I think is fast becoming really relevant, fast becoming uh, the core of healthcare. So thank you very much everyone uh, from all over the world uh, for joining us. It's been absolutely great uh, to have you all here. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things uh, before we finish. Uh, so the home edition of Raising the Bar uh, has been uh, a series of six speakers over six weeks, with this being the sixth talk. Um, however, the advantage of us being the last is that the other five talks have been recorded and are now available uh, on the university's website. So after I finish this uh, blurb, we're going to put up a slide and that'll have all the details on it. If you want even more Raising the Bar talks, uh, most of the university's back catalogue uh, is also available um, on our website. So you can sit down and go through those. Um, so with that, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I hope you've really enjoyed uh, the talk this evening. It's certainly great uh, to have a chat uh, with Hilary about these things. And hopefully we will um, see you all around the university if and when we are able to. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining us and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.